Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Introducing myself, I'm the President of United States of America, Sophia. Welcome to our first simulation on the Israeli-Palestinian crisis. I will invite our secret Secretary of State to start on the matter at hand. Thank you all for coming. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. The Israel-Palestinian conflict is a clash of two territorial unions, ethnic communities for the right to create their own monocultural countries in its universal recognition. This conflict goes on for already 68 years and the peace achievement is seen almost impossible. We face the urgent necessity of moving forward because the Israel-Palestinian conflict and the broader Arab-Israel conflict is a national security threat to the United States of America. There are many reasons why America should promote peace in the Middle East. Promoting peace is a good thing itself, but today, more than ever, it is because our national security interests are at stake that we need to promote peace. The Israel-Palestinian conflict is a national security threat to America. Indeed, American lives are being lost today because of the perpetuation of the Israel-Palestinian conflict. A peace agreement is a key to achieving most of our goals in the greater Middle East. Firstly, given that Israel is a national security interest, an ally and partner of the United States, then the conflict that threatens Israel is every day must be a threat to the national security interests of the United States as well. Secondly, this conflict creates anger that fuels the enemies killing Americans today. There have been many innocent victims of terrorism whose killers claim to be motivated by this conflict. It is thus one of the driving forces of radical extremism throughout the Islamic world and becoming more so every day. Failure to find a secure, just and fair peace means that extremism and anger will fester and spread further, producing more and more threats to American national security and ultimately to American citizens. Third and not less important point is that this conflict weakens our allies and friends, the moderates in the Islamic world who are trying to fight our enemies. American and other third party efforts play a crucial role in safeguarding the possibility of future negotiations. A policy of containment or conflict management, however, is insufficient to resolve the dilemma. In principle, Previous difficulties of uh, negotiations mainly occurred to Palestine, particularly <coughs> Hamas policy of protectionism. Given the recent Hamas agreement to recognize the Israel state, peace settlement becomes more promising. Palestinian and Israeli peoples have regularly polled in favor of a deal that established two states with borders that closely followed the 1967 lines of separation between Israel and then hostile neighbors with Jerusalem as a shared capital and a just settlement for the refugees, which practically must mean compensation to be paid mostly by the United States. This deal would not be only acceptable to the majority of Israelis and Palestinians, it would be welcomed by international community, the Arab states and the vast majority of people in the Muslim world. We need a settlement that will deny murderers the motivation and justification that they have used over decades. We should support two-state solution as the means for resolving their dispute due to significant proportions of Israelis and Palestinians supporting negotiations. Only such a mutually agreement, agreed settlement can produce lasting security for Israelis and Palestinians alike. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we'll introduce our Secretary of Defense to give us a um, thank you, Mr. President. First of all, I would like to say um, I'm representing the Department of Defense, and our objective is to, um, is to find out if the U.S. involvement in any way is affecting our national security and also our interests. This memo outlines the importance of the involvement of the U.S. and the role it has to play in the Israeli-Palestinian case. The conflict between these two states poses a threat to our national security, firstly, because depending on how we handle this issue, it can fuel or, or calm the anger of those in the Middle East who can be termed our enemies, like Al-Qaeda or the ISIS. In fact, to some in the Arab world, this conflict has been the driving force to extremist actions against the US and US citizens. 
Also, the security of Israel is also aligned to the security of the US as our military and intelligence um, agencies are deeply integrated. Our objectives are number one, to ensure the national security of the US and its ally. Number two, to eradicate or minimize the involvement of military action. Number three, to ensure the interest of the US in the Arab world is not jeopardized. Upon these objectives, we, the, we have three policy policies that we can offer today. The first one will be the direct involvement of the US in the Palestinian-Israeli case. Before I start, we have to consider the fact that, the Isra that Israel has been a very important and effective part to the, to the US military. First of all, it's, also, it's very much effective in counterbalancing system. It's very much effective to counterbalance radical forces in the Middle East. Forces such as radical Islam extremism. It's also effective in thwarting of the, Ira of the Iraqi and Syrian nuclear programs, which is a major threat to US security and power in the Middle East. A direct involvement of the US would make would as would make us, you know, would make us play a very critical role in the peace process of this conflict. Our military alliance with Israel is very important as Israel's high tech weapons are very much needed in our nation. Although while considering Israel, we have to consider the Arab nations and their growing frustration with the Israeli Palestinian case. Adopting this policy will allow us to be fully involved economically, militarily, and ideologically in this process. It guarantees our interest as we can influence the negotiations and decision-making process. Although failure to resolve this case can cause Arab nations like Saudi Arabia, who we already have friendly relationship with, to lose faith in our capabilities, as most nations, as most countries in the Arab world see we, the US, as the only country that can actually put pressure on Israel to give up some land and therefore sit down for a peace settlement. Also, due to our direct involvement, the failure and success of this conflict will be our responsibilities. So terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda, who already use this conflict as a driving force of their attacks against the US, will take on more heightened attacks on the US and US officials in diaspora if this conflict is termed as a failure. The second policy option would be a moderate involvement of the US in the Israeli-Palestinian case. Although we have long since been playing a major role in this, in this conflict, a change in the course of our role is a possible option too. We can decide to play a minimal role in this peace settlement by not directly being involved in the peace negotiations. Rather, we can just provide favorable conditions for achievement of a successful peace negoti negotiation process. Adopting this policy will require us to provide military assistance, not necessarily on defense or on the side of offense, but rather as a peace mechanism. Our reduced involvement in the peace negotiations does not necessarily mean we will not be involved. Rather, it will serve as facilitators. This will allow the two states to air their grievances and adopt, uh, adopt a solution without any external influence. So the results of this process, the results of this peace process can either would not be our responsibility as our influence was not put into it. Any decision taken by them will be theirs, thereby reducing any possibility of bias, which can in turn reduce any form of aggression from the Arab world. Adopting this policy will allow the U.S. to remain neutral, thereby not risking its relationship with Israel and well as its relationship with the Arab world. And the last policy option is no U.S. involvement at all in the Palestinian-Israeli case. Another option is to not have any involvement in this conflict and its peace negotiations. While this option might seem like it does not support the U.S. interests, but non-involvement of the U.S. would keep things the way they are. The U.S. and Israel will keep on with its relations, and, and, as is, and Israel, as we know, is an important ally of ours. The integration of our intelligence agencies have been effective and efficient in the counterbalancing of terror in the Middle East, although adopting this, poly, adopting this usher option will cause the U.S. to be involved in a conflict which might arise to war, because without the influence of the U.S., Israelis would not sit for the peace conflict for the peace process, and this can lead to heightened attacks, as we already have attacks by Hamas on, Israel, on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. But without our influence, this would not affect the US 
national security as well, as we have already put in place <coughs> counterbalancing technology such as the Iron Dome, which is a missile detecting defense system that detects short range missiles. This was due to the attack by Lebanon on the West Bank. Adoption of this policy will more likely affect our national security as the lack of US influence in the negotiation process could lead to a more heightened conflict between the opposing sides. And lack of support for Israel could sever our military alliance. While lack of support for Palestine could increase more extremist attacks from groups like Al Qaeda and other Arab countries. In conclusion, while these options are considered, we must also put into consideration the attacks of Hamas on Israel the attacks, shown, the attacks have shown the resilience of the terrorist group, which is a threat to our security, especially as they are not easily containable. Finally, Turkey, sh Turkey should not be given a definite role in this process, as Turkey's unpredictability and its semi-friendly relationship with Russia makes Turkey a possible threat to our interest and security. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will invite national security advisor to give Thank you, Mr. President. I am the National Security Advisor. Our policy has promoted a two-state solution for this long and complex case between the Israeli and Palestinians who aim to establish their own sovereign state. However, there are several factors acted as an obstacle to achieve a final settlement. So a quick decision from our administration will contribute to the protection of our national security and the interest of our country and its allies around the world generally, especially in the Middle East. Hence, in the supreme interest of our national security, a definitive solution to this conflict will ease our concern as national security advisors and give us a greater opportunity to consider issues which acquire also an international importance. Moreover, it will cut the way for the warlords and the supporters of the terrorism who threat our national security and our interest as well. We understand very well how difficult the task of our country to solve this issue. But we must not also ignore that our allies and friends can also help us. But we should take into account that there are many political variables and change in the balance of power between the major forces who are affect directly the Middle East. Since following uh, the period of the Arab Spring, especially, and the greater interventions from other countries. So uh, this requires us to reconsider and think in more viable way to avoid the previous mistake. Since we are a hegemon country, the whole world is waiting for our reaction. In addition to many countries along with our citizens are relying on us for their security guarantees. If we won't function quickly towards the Israeli and Palestinian case and to reach final settlement, we may lose some of our international influence in front of the world, which will allow a broader area for our counterparts to play a role sooner or later. Here, I would like to remind you, Mr. President, by some of the points, which is very sensitive to the safety and the security of our nation. The failure to resolve the decades-old crisis fuels Islamic extremism and the Iranian designs in the region, especially with the growing of strength and influence of many terrorist groups, such as the Islamic States and other groups, which target United States security directly or indirectly, with the greater Russian and Iranian intervention, especially in Syria and Iraq. So if we reach to a quick solution, we can limit the ambitions of many of our competitors. Second, our current administration, in cooperation with you, Mr. President, and the leaders of the Republican Party, we emphasize the importance of Israel and its security for our security and our position in the world. So, therefore, we are committed to develop a partnership and support with uh, this historic ally of our country. The protection of our interests in the Middle East requires a strategic partner, such as Israel, in all the fields. More important, combating terrorism and punish the destabilizers of the world. Third, an attempt to revive peace talking and settlement between these two countries guarantee us a greater chance to, remo to remain the most powerful country in the world, to solve the world problems, and weaken the role of our counterparts. 
Thus, it will strengthen our external and internal capabilities as a superpower. While any failure will show that we might appear weak and we cannot play an important role, especially in finding diplomatic solution to this problem. As an advisor, I would like to take a closer look at the challenges that surround us in the Middle East, because the Israeli and Palestinian case are happening here. Therefore, our ability to meet this challenge create a greater confidence in our citizen as a nation who can play on more than one stage. Finally, I stress that strengthening our political and economic relations with Egypt, Jordan, Turkey, and the Gulf states as an important allies and mediators to solve the Israeli and Palestinian case. I believe that our interest in the Middle East and strengthening our national security require us to work with the old friends and partners to ensure our security. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll uh, invite the representative of the to give Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, the discovery of natural gas in the region, in the Middle East and the East Mediterranean, and how it's going to help promote peace in the region. Uh, while the, situa the situation in the Middle East has been turbulent and violence increased significantly in the past eight years under the Obama administration, the rules of the game have also changed in the region. Hamas changed its charter where it did accept a Palestinian state based on the 1967 borders. The talks in Cyprus have been resumed and ISIS presence is almost quelled. We in the U.S. Department of Energy believe that these factors constitute a great opportunity to achieve peace in the region while developing a natural gas program that will not only benefit the region but serve uh, American interests and the interests of the state of Israel, which is one of our key allies. In the case of Israel and Palestine, the unexpected change in the Hamas Charter will reduce divisions amongst Palestinians themselves and make peace more viable with Israelis. As a first step, the U.S. could push for a two-state solution, mediate the peace process, and ensure both sides sit on the table and make concessions to achieve a long-lasting peace agreement that will benefit both sides, eventually normalizing relationships with the Arab countries that are neighboring them. Israel is mulling a new law on offshore zones, which Lebanon sees as laying claim to a disputed 860 kilometers square block. Thus, our second step should be pressuring Israel into giving up maritime territory to Lebanon, since Israel has an abundance of natural gas fields, including Tamar and Leviathan. This won't just be a nice gesture gesture by the Israelis, but it will boost Lebanon's tricky economy, since they absorb more than two million Syrian refugees into the country. Moreover, it will add legitimacy to the Lebanese government and reduce Hezbollah's presence on the Israeli border. In Cyprus, however, the case is different. There is barely any political violence in the island, but the use of natural resources is limited, and Cyprus is ge generally generating environmentally and friendly fuel using expensive methods. Therefore, switching to natural gas would bring numerous benefits to both sides of the island. The first benefit is cheap electricity production. Given the fact that a kilowatt hour price of electricity power in Cyprus is the second highest in the European Union, the positive effect of having a cheap electricity price will reverberate in other sectors such as tourism and manufacturing. However, switching to natural gas won't work unless a settlement is reached in the island because Turkey has warned the island over moving ahead with planned drilling without a Cyprus settlement and threatened it would do not anything necessary to stop the move. Another critical issue in is Russian, uh, Russian meddling in the region, where they take uh, advantage of instability with the Arab, Arab countries to exert massive influence in those countries, whether by violently sending their military to Syria or by abetting Iranian proxy milita militant groups such as Hezbollah in Lebanon. Therefore, achieving peace in the Middle East would be a blow to Russian interference in the region. It would be also wise to transport ga gas by pipeline from Israel via Turkey, or in liquefied form by ship to Europe, plugging the East Mediterranean into Europe's grid, and providing an alternative to Russia, which has far worse relations with the EU due to the Ukrainian crisis. The US Department of Energy has studied the region extensively, and our findings indicate that we should push for peace in the Middle East, with an emphasis in Israel and Palestine, and develop a gas pipeline from Israel through the economic zone of Cyprus into Turkey, which is the gateway to Europe. Although Germany and France have expressed their disagreement towards such a deal due to the events that are happening lately in Turkey and the nature of the president, our recommendation is that such a plan would benefit the region the most, more than any other alternative. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Madam President. Um, well, I am the permanent representative to the United States, and I'm obviously here with the rest of all the officials and executives here to present policy options uh, of a U.S. response to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, impasse. Now, uh, we all know that since 1947, the United Nations called for partici partition of Palestine into an Arab and a Jewish side has evolved into numerous uh, problems and conflicts like the 1949 Arab-Israeli uh, war, the 1967 Six-Day War, as well as further occupation, terror in the region, and further UN resolutions. Well, uh, I would like to state that the failure of the United States to, to act towards this problem could portray the United States as an unfit upholder of democracy and could destabilize the geopolitical strength of the United States in the region. Now, uh, for a little background about why we are seated here today and why the problem still lies. Uh, the primary cause of the impasse lies in the dilemma of Israel towards allowing a self-determined Palestinian state its views on Jerusalem as its capital and its settlement in the West Bank. Well, uh, including also its uncertainty about the return of the Palestinian uh, refugees. And on the Palestinian side, uh, we have its near radio silence from the West and other Arab states a policy option towards breaking the impasse should be operationalized. Now, my agency has three major objectives concerning this issue. The first one would be to prevent uh, a, back, a, a backlash by the international uh, community uh, on the United States, and also to avoid destabilizing the relationship that the U.S. has built with other Arab states uh, while threatening U.S.-Israeli ties and also to ensure that the U.S. pursues the adv advancement of a two-state solution to end the conflict and to foster peace in the region. Now, what are the uh, options that uh, my agency advises? Well, the first one would be to propose a building on an amendment of new resolutions to the United Nations. Well, as a result of the resolution 194, uh, the Palestinian people refer to it as providing justifiable reasons for not only the Palestinian refugees from 1948, but also their descendants to return back to Palestine. Now, adding to the over 300,000 refugees from the 1967 war, we can see that this is an enormous number that could cause a problem at the negotiation table with Israel. We must advocate a new resolution to address the parameters of this repatriation before the United Nations General Assembly. Considering the latest developments of Hamas changing its charter to consider a two-state solution. On a more realistic note, the United States should bear in mind the United Nations Security Council Resolution 242, which called for land for peace and apply it in the context of today's uh, political configurations. I would propose to the General Assembly the reaffirmation of Israel's withdrawal of considerable parts of the settlement by phases. Second policy option. Uh, this would be to move towards a community-based negotiation. For a long time, we have operated on a track two based diplomacy towards solving this problem. But it is important that we support a two-state solution because a stable Middle East ensures the geopolitical strength of the United States in the region. And the narrative has always been on the higher ups, but recourse to something different could change the narrative. Thirdly, development of a new security architecture. The National Security Council ought to pay great heed to the security concerns of both sides and develop strategies of not just confidence building, but a system for the two societies to interact, to forestall any further plans for terrorism and violence from either side. Lastly, 
we must avoid granting Turkey any major roles. We ought to be happy, of course, for Turkey's move towards a de jure presidential system, but we must bear in mind the brewing closeness between the Russian Federation and Turkey. The last attempted coup in Turkey and the changed dynamics of the Turkish politics and considering deteriorating relations of our two states must be put into consideration. However, we ought to move towards amending relationships first with Turkey before we can entrust any roles to them. Seeing the benign neglect of Turkey to its NATO allies, it does not appear in Erdogan's uh, best interest to take on a full-on Israeli side. Now, what are my recommendations? Well, the first priority of this agency, of course, is to secure a two-state solution. But you see, Mr. President, uh, we must do this in a way that we can ensure Israel's security as well as to regain the confidence of the Arab world and to resurrect the appeal of the liberal democracy of the United States. To accomplish these objectives, I recommend that the President and the Secretary of State must intensify shuttle diplomacy between Israel and Palestine. And also, uh, it is in the interest of the United States that the permanent representative of the UN should propose to the United Nations a sending of peacekeeping following peace talks to avoid further terrorism and aggression in the region, bearing in mind that both sides of the conflict are rational enough to avoid a backlash of the international community. However, all listed policy options are not mutually exclusive. Rather than an entirely proactive role, the United States must assume the lead in ensuring that peace prevails via a communal diplomatic process. With the advancement of ISIS, it is in the best interest of the United States to ensure confidence and end any possibility of the Palestinian government going over to the wrong side. Although it might not seem to be the best time for most parties, the passivity of the Arab states and the West, including Turkey, must be utilized. The Hamas declaration of recent on the consideration of a two-state solution is a blessing in disguise. As part of any response, it is important to pre prevent any Russian influence in the region, particularly pertaining to this conflict. Returning to the drawing board is highly important and should be taken seriously. This agency would continue to support a policy action by the U.S. towards building confidence and respecting the rights of all parties involved. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, President. This, out this outline option for the U.S. government towards the involvement in the Israeli-Palestinian process, the U.S. had 10 years military assistance deals to, which is worth three. 38 billion over the course of decades, and an, in, an increase of roughly 27% of the money pledged in the last agreement, which was signed in 2007. Israel, which is seen as the largest community respect of the US foreign assistance in, since the World War, and the and also the U.S. humanitarian assistance for the Palestinian refugees in Gaza and elsewhere continue through the contribution to the U.N. Relief and Work Agency for Palestinian refugees in the Near East. My first option would be the strengthening bilateral assistance to the Palestinian, which would also strengthen the relationship between them. Being the top government donor, Palestine being the top, um, U.S. being the top government donor in 2015, first a positive message to the Palestinians that they are also back, being backed up by them. The aid of Palestinian authorities is largely for mostly economic and social services. Restoration of Israeli restoration, restoration of the Turkish Israel relation which would enhance the perspective for a regional stability with the collapse of 
collapse of Israel and Palestinian peace process, the military confrontation between the Israel and Hamas. We pray the Turkish relation may help at advance the U.S. strategy and goals on the issue. Palestinian national authorities have heavy dependence of the, of the foreign aid and boosted by the wide network of Turkish NGOs. Expand, if, expand investment interest in the World Bank. Palestinian officials are looking at Ankara's potential in the conflict and renew, renewing the interest in Turkey and Washington would help the we help coordinate in favor of the renewal of the regional rules for Turkey. Minimizing the spending of the qualitative military edge in 20, 2016, the US spent $487.5 million on this US-Israeli military defense program and plans to spend between 280 and 261 million in 2007. Recommended this policy would facilitate and reduce the U.S. cost of spending in this crisis. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, but Secretary Chile, what are your policies on this? To strengthen the U.S. military um, assistance to the Palestinian and um, strengthening Israel's qualitative military edge and minimizing the spending of pol foreign policy aids in Israel and Palestine. Thank you very much. I am the administrator of the United States Agency of International <coughs> Development. And um, the Israeli-Palestine conflict has since been an, in the expanse of the United States. And it continues to be an issue that needs our engrossment as it, can, and to, as it continuation means that our nation stays affected in the process. Um, the United States has since 1949 had relations with the Israel and in the involvement of the United States Agency, the USAID, has since come into place because of the continuation of this ongoing conflict. Um, this continuation has brought economic instability for both parties and if the economy is um, unstable, this affects the US as well. As the USAID administers project assistance through grants, contracts, and um, there is an amount of $4 billion, the rest which goes toward budget support um, for the Palestine Authority, for the Palestine's USAID since um, 1994, was to promote the prevention and mitigation of terrorist groups in Israel from the Sunni Islamist group and other militant organizations fostering stability, prosperity, and self-governance that may incline Palestinians toward the peaceful coexistence <coughs> with Israel and a two-state solution, and thirdly, meeting humanitarian needs. This has been a frustrating mission for the USAID already. Giving aid to Palestine is encumbered by the fact that Hamas, which is considered an Islamic group um, by the US, the European Union, um, continues to control most of the hospitals, schools, and it's hard for us to aid um, them in the sense that the USAID is not allowed to aid terrorists. This makes, um, hard, this makes it hard for the USAID to assist Palestinian civilians. Therefore, Mr. President, our nation is greatly involved in this conflict because of a few factors, which include maintaining stability, maintaining our relations with alliances in the Middle East, sustaining our oil flow, and um, continued spread of liberal vials and world leadership. Civil wars and terrorist groups seem to be close juxtaposition in the Middle East, and this chaos has potential to spill to the borders and threaten the USA as a nation and our <coughs> allies. This means that the USA is helped toward Palestine and Israel is, the, um, is for the purpose of preventing civil wars, terrorism, bringing stability to the Palestinian refugees, and so maintaining peace in total. Our nation, the United States, has allies in the Middle East, um, which are uh, Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Turkey, and Egypt, who help us in combating terrorism, so caused by hosting our military bases, shares intelligence, and cooperation in military actions. 
It is then viable to the U.S. that the U.S. aid continue to work towards contributing to the Israeli-Palestinian concord, as the prolonged conflict between the two will endanger surrounding Arab states and our nation, the United States, from therefore corporately working and um, each of our partners being in contact with us from the ground to respond to future issues. Our economic well-being as the United States of America momentously depends on the free flow of goods and ideas across the borders, which means this aid has to be continued. Accompanying that fact, the United States receives oil from the Middle East. This is consequently promoted by our power and security. The oil um, imported from the Persian Gulf is supplied on a global scale, and the conflict in the Middle East would mean, therefore, shrinkage of oil supply to foreign markets that badly affecting our economy and the world economy. Henceforth, the US aid is involved in giving aid to Palestine and Israel, and this will help prevent interruption in oil flows from the Middle East to our nation and to the whole globe. Alongside the intervention of the US aid support, we have received um, aid from Turkey in forms of financial aid, goods, and including, but not limited, to health, security, education, institutions, and institution building as well as agriculture. Turkey, therefore, has stood by the U.S. in supporting neg um, a negotiating settlement in Israel-Palestine conflict on the basis of the U.N. resolutions 242, 338, 1397, 151, which end, in the end helps to protect our economic interests and allies. With all this in mind, a few policy actions could be put into consideration. First, the United States could choose to withdraw some of the funds they are putting towards to giving aid to both Israelis and the Palestinians as the conflict has been going on for quite a while and put them towards other projects to our state. But, this is, but if this is done, then it means that less peace and stability is ascertained in the Israel-Palestine conflict. The citizens that need help get less of it and in the end, we lose maximum profits from our partnership with Israel. The second policy option would be to completely withdraw the US aid from assisting in this conflict. This surely stands as an option we could consider to save funds as we are putting towards um, Israel and Palestine conflict. But the forfeiture that we face if we choose to withdraw is more detrimental to our relations and allies in the Middle East. Our hopes to maintain peace and leaves us viable, vulnerable to the spread of civil wars, economic disruptions, and affects our relation, uh, leadership position in the international system. The third policy option would be to continue to give aid at the best capacity that we can. And this will look good for our global reputation of keeping peace, maintain relations between us and our allies in the Middle East, promote continued relations between our nation and Palestine, and therefore benefit the U.S. economy, security, banks, steel industry, and position in the leadership of the international system. The fourth policy option that I have is that um, the U.S. changes its stance towards Hamas, and therefore they would try to bring Hamas to the table. And then Hamas and Fatah will now be in um, resolution, which will foster reconciliation on one side. And then if this resolution is there, it would make it easier to then come to a two-state um, solution, as then if one side is together, and then it will not be easier to have communication with Israel. Um, therefore, Mr. President, between Israel and Palestinians, there is no fixed resolution date. But then again, it is still beneficial to the United States this war affects other relations on a global scale. As long as this conflict goes on, we would need to stick to the policy which is viable and keeps America's best interest at hand. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. I'll invite the Attorney General to the Thank you, Mr. President. The Israeli-Palestinian impasse is one issue that has lasted for years that requires a solution. As the Attorney General, it is my job to ensure that any policy decided are in compliance with our domestic and international law. 
With this in mind, whatever policy decided on at the end, if successful, would not only strength, strengthen our reputation of having positive image, but would also increase trust in us as, true, as a true democracy by putting the provision of the Constitution before our decisions. When it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian issue, there are some important matters we can't help but consider whilst looking at the best possible solution to the problem. These matters include sovereignty, rights, relationship, re relationships with our allies, <laughs> and re religious possessions. These matters are important to us as a democracy, as provided in our constitu constitution should be upholded by us. As the Attorney General, I would like to give the following recommendations. Firstly, it is, for, it is for us to allow the Israelis and the Palestinians reach an agreement on their, at their own time, instead of trying to resolve the conflict. By doing this, we are giving them the opportunity to come together by themselves. If this happens, then we know they are ready to solve the conflict, which is obviously in our interest. Secondly, by making both sides see the need to give up something so as to resolve the conflict. The Israelis are not willing to give, us, give, us, give off part of their territories due to security, which is very important. The Palestinians, on the other hand, see the land as an ancestral gift. Until we are able to make them or they themselves are willing to see that, they are, that what they seek needs to change, then the conflict will remain unsolved. The third recommendation, it is for us to continue to provide aid to our ally, which is Israel for as long as we continue to find a lasting problem to the solution, providing them with whatever they need as so as to protect our, our own personal interest. Out of all these recommendations I have made, I would like to suggest the last one. There is the saying that you cannot force a camel to the river, to, you can force a camel to the river bank, but you can't force it to drink water. We can bring both Israel and Palestinians into the negotiation table, but it is them themselves that but if they themselves do not recognize the need for a solution, then it isn't likely to happen. I support that we continue to stand with our allies, strengthening our relationship so as to protect our interests. With that, we can decide or help look for a solution while the conflict lasts. Thank you. Yeah. I'll be talking on the Israeli-Palestine conflict, and um, this memo outlines the United States interest in Palestine-Israeli conflict, following the National Security Council policy towards the conflict and how solutions can be derived. The Council has preferred the two-state solution, bringing Israel and Palestine conflict to an end, but the conflict continues without lasting solutions from the previous U.S. administrative regimes. The war between Israel and Palestinian people started when Israel gained independence in 1948, this causing Palestinian refugees to flee to neighboring countries like uh, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon. The Arab-Israeli war was sparked by this action, although Israel became victorious. Other wars like the Yom Kippur uh, arise, in the, arise but the U.S. military and financial assistance to Israel helped them gain larger territories beyond the U.N. 1947 partition plan. This caused uh, strong hostility on Israel from the Arab neighbors. The U.S. national security is threatened by this action, and it poses a main issue in the U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. The key players to the conflicts are the Hamas, which occupies the Gaza Strip, Fatah, uh, the West Bank, and Israel settler movement. Objectives: one, ending the Israel-Palestine conflict; two. Israel's survival in the Middle East, and three, ending the Arab-Israeli war. Options and analysis. Jerusalem first is the first option. The, highest, the high risk top down approach states that Jerusalem be divided into west and east, west to Israel as its capital, and east to uh, Palestine. The U.S. re-established an embassy in the West and East Jerusalem, acknowledging Palestine's claim to East Jerusalem and granting recognition to the Palestine state, or U.S. should suspend its recognition of Jerusalem as Israel and Palestine capital until both sides resolve the issue. The second policy option is um, bottom-up. The president could instead 
choose a more conventional effort that attempts to use time to shape a more favorable negotiating environment by arresting the negative dynamics in the West Bank and work with Egypt and Jordan to promote the Palestinian leadership with a mandate to negotiate with Israel. Israel will have to stop all construction in the East Jerusalem and maintain its 1967 land partition line. The last option, out, uh, outside in. The president will be involved in convening the leader of the squad, the United States, Russia, EU, and the UN, and the Arab side, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, in a summit to announce a set of agreed principles that would serve as a term of reference for direct Israel-Palestine negotiation to achieve a two-state solution. Recommendation. The first two options will be more complex, making peace Set, making peace settlement difficult to achieve from the religious angle. Jerusalem is seen by both parties as a religious set for Jewish and uh, Muslim in general. Apart from Mecca and Medina, the mosque in the Temple Mount, Al Sharif, is seen as a great importance to the Muslim religion and also to the Jews. If the first option is carried out, it could generate into war from the Arab world and further expand Israel-Palestine conflict in the region. This will help because both sides lay equal claims to Jerusalem. If the second is carried out by the president, this will cause great problems for Israel and Prime Minister, and it will be seen as unacceptable to the Jewish Home Party. In conclusion, outside-in approach is the best option to a two-state solution in Israel-Palestine conflict as it brings the West and the Arab world to draw a final conclusion and set fundamental principles to the case. Um, the principles are the negotiation should lead to an agreement that could end the conflict, end all claims, and establish two states living side by side in peace and security. Second, the borders between the two states should be based on the 1967 lines with mutual agreed swaps. Third, the president should ensure that Israel, its ally in the region, can define itself against any threat and the occupation that began in 1967 and enable the Palestinians to live securely in an independent state. Jerusalem should serve as, a, um, sorry, Jerusalem should serve as the shared capital for both states with special arrangements to maintain the status quo in the religious side. Finally, they should be a just and agreed solution to the Palestinian refugees problem based on the UN General Assembly Resolution 181 that provides for the establishment of independent Arab and Jewish states in the Palestine with equal rights for all the citizens. The US interest in this case is based on two grounds. One, protecting Israel, its ally in the region, and also protecting the Jewish holy sites and homeland for all Jews. Um, secondly, creating a favorable condition for peace in the region with the Arab Middle East in avoiding a religious uprising and economic sanction like the case of 1970 crisis in the US, maintaining peace with its Arab friends like Saudi Arabia. And finally, Turkey was the first Arab nation to recognize Israel as a state in 1949 in the Arab world, following the Ottoman legacy, it tries to settle the conflict, but no proper solution has been carried out. Although Turkey and Israel relationship flourished in the past regimes, Erdogan follows Muslim principles in fostering the independence of the Palestinians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. President. And I would like to also extend my greetings to all the officers. A generation has passed since the signing of the Oslo Agreement. And the Oslo Agreement was signed between Israel and Palestine. Uh, it was guided by the concept that the Oslo Accords would bring, that the two-state solution would bring a permanent solution for the Israeli and the Palestinian conflict. But two decades have passed, and no solution has been found until now. The officers have brought different solutions to the table. 
However, when a conflict does not reach a resolution, what is questioned is not only the terms of those resolutions, but also the framework, the mechanisms used in trying to reach those resolutions. Therefore, I have outlined a few, a few points that, that, should, that, a few points that are considered in order to solve the Israeli and Palestinian conflict. Firstly, despite the fact that the dis disputing sides and mediating parties gathered around the negotiations table, it looks pretty much that they come from different backgrounds and certainly from different conflict management traditions and practices. These practices will figure permanently in the way they deal with the issues at hand. Therefore, if we are all made of the same fabric or we are all here to make a deal, approach may sound good, but it is not likely to carry much weight in this situation. In the Muslim-Arab conflict contest, there is always a vic victim and perpetrator role. Two distinct sides, each with its own role in the process. Unfortunately, both the Israelis and the Palestinians themselves see themselves as victims, and no one accepts the perpetrator role leaving no one to take the perpetrator's role, thus dooming the process from the word go. Taken together with the former point, this alone can create an impossible barrier to movement towards dealing with substi sub, um, substantive issues. Thirdly, making peace in the Middle East is a ritual that requires a lot of patience, a lot of attention, and the sequence expediency may sound good, but it's not likely to help the process along. And finally, both sides at the table will essentially be playing to their local constituencies back home to get them to make consensus in a way that they will stand a chance for being given a hearing back home. The mediator needs to equip the sides with certain reframing tools, something that requires intimate familiarity with the negotiators, their constituencies, and also the various applicable tools for the Muslim and Arab arbitration. In the absence of this, the disputants themselves will either bulk at making bold moves or their constituencies at home will scuttle them on arrival. If all these points are considered, we will have an open door to the Israeli and Palestinian conflict, and definitely we can then reach a solution. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Mrs. President. Um, as we all know, the ongoing conflict between Israel and Palestinian is both simple to understand yet deeply complex. At the heart of this uh, conflict is the basic idea that both sides believe in, where Israelis believe that they're entitled to the land now known as Israel, and Palestinians believe that they're entitled to the land now known as Palestine. Our task, uh, first of all, is to protect the United States' um, interests our values, and um, if we remain in different understanding that thereby will help to fix the dangerous tendencies uh, fraught with escalation of the conflict and instability in the region where we have our interests, then we will reject our responsibility that lying on us. Yes, historically Washington uh, has viewed Israel as a crucial political and economic ally in the rich Middle East and has provided Israel with the highest amount of financial and military assistance of any other foreign countries. These days, however, the United States has used its leverage to urge Israel to move, um, to move on and to recognize the Palestine as autonomous republic. Um, and previous administration, they tried to find magic solution for this problem, but they didn't do that. So we, as a new administration, we have to find the ways to solve this problem. So what I can recommend is next parameters. First of all, security. Neither Israel nor future Palestine should use and uh, could use force against one another. The United States could spearhead the effort to deploy NATO forces in the Jordan River Valley. And we, as the United States, will um, serve as the final guarantor of regional peace and stability. Second, Jerusalem. <coughs> Jerusalem will become the capital of both states. 
East Jerusalem as the capital of Palestine and the West Jerusalem as the capital of the Israel. The old city will be controlled on the basis of demographics at the time of an agreement. Third, refugees and the rights of return. The rights of return to Israel uh, could only exist in limited capacity enacted their family reunification for certain Palestinian refugees. The United States could lead the establishment of an international fund to compensate and help that refugees, Palestinian and Jewish ones. And finally, water rights, fair and equitable distribution on both sides. So to move um, these parameters forward, um, we need international recognition of these parameters, for example, um, in UN Security Council resolution. So um, nowadays, we cannot support only one side. Um, we also have some interests in the Palestine as well. For example, US traditional support for Christian communities around the world, which in Palestine case can lead to support either Palestine or Israel position. The concern for the Christian minority in the Palestine Authority leads in some cases to criticism of Israel policies as obstructive to Christians' living conditions, and in some cases to criticism of Palestinian policies um, as a form of uh, persecution against Christians. Strategic interests in the region which compel Washington to lend partial support to Palestinian aspirations in order not to antagonize Arab or other governments, as well as to avoid military escalation in case of total despair on the part of the Palestinian. So Mr. Uh, Mrs. President, if not us, the no one will take actions to solve this problem, neither Russia nor Turkey, because of their own issues with Israel, as we know. So our best interest is to institute the pr uh, principle of promoting peace and security and prevent the war. So we cannot close our eyes on our responsibility to be an honest broker in the Middle East. In order to have good relationship with the Jewish and Palestinian um, people and Arab people, we need to find ways to implement these parameters which I suggested earlier. So if we do so, then uh, probably all sides will be satisfied with the results. Thank you for your attention. I will invite the recognition of the champions to give us the basis of the Thank you very much. Um, first of all, it's important to note that the United States has been a very, very, very key figure in the negotiating process since the beginning. It's very important that we stay involved and that we be honest and straightforward with our opinions and our views. Um, Israeli security is our utmost priority. I think we can all agree on that because Israeli security is so deeply tied to U.S. security. Um, let me just say a few things about the background of the situation. Now, Israel declared its independence on May 14, 1948. Although we did recognize them unofficially the very next day, it wasn't an official recognition until a year later on May 15, 1949. Um, now the problem is there, there are a few key points that we need to recognize, issues, places that are of really strategic importance. Um, first of all, let me just point out that Israel is the largest recipient of US military and economic aid since 1976, receiving an average of $9.8 million a day. And it is because of these decades of large financial contributions that we are so tied and interested in promoting peace and maintaining Israeli sovereignty. Um, the United States, sorry, Israel has militarily occupied the West Bank since the 1967 Arab-Israeli War. The West Bank is, of course, an area of importance, and the Palestinians have exercised limited self-rule in some areas since the mid-1990s. Um, Israelis have been living in settlements in East Jerusalem and the West Bank, and the legality of these settlements have been disputed by the international community and the United Nations has dealt with those in many resolutions, but the problem with the UN is it has not always been able to enforce any of these resolutions. Another point of interest of, and in the dispute is the Gaza Strip. And although Israel has withdrawn militarily, militarily it still controls many access points. Now that is something that has continued to contribute to the conflict. Okay, this agency has four principal objectives in no order of importance. Um, first, we want to resolve the conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians peacefully. I'm sure we can all agree on that. Uh, second of all, we'd like to maintain Israeli sovereignty and form 
a sovereign Palestinian state, or in other words, create a two-state solution. A two-state solution is very significant, it's very important, and it's probably the only way we can achieve peace. Um, a one-state solution would not work for Israel because it would not allow them to either be a Jewish state or be democratic. They cannot be both at the same time. The Arab Palestinians would outnumber the Jewish population if we did create a one-state one solution. The problem is with the ongoing occupation is it's making it a lot more difficult to create a two-state solution. So it would be recommended that Israel return to its 1967 borders because that's what the international community recognizes as legal. Um, our third recommendation would be, sorry, our third objective would be to avoid any escalation of the conflict to, with the Arab states uh, and their interests involved. It could escalate if the conflict continues. And most importantly for my agency, as the Director of National Intelligence, we need to maintain our intelligence relationship with Israel. That is very vital in maintaining an upper hand in the region and maintaining stability in the region. Now, the options I have suggested, there are two options and they go hand in hand. First of all, we are in a very unique position as the United States to reinitiate the negotiation process. Um, but the negotiation process between the Israelis and Palestinians has failed in the past because neither side trusts the other. They don't believe the other has their other side's best interests at heart. So maybe a suggestion for this would be each side can delegate the negotiation process to other countries or other people. And what we could do as the United States is not, no longer just be involved ourselves, involve a lot more other countries. This would showcase our goodwill and you know, our, our desire for peace. Um, now, what we can do is, along with this, is create a committee of nations that would monitor the negotiating process. We make it a lot more public. This would put the agenda, at, this would put, sorry, the conflict at the top of everyone's agenda. No longer is it just important to us as the United States to maintain Israeli sovereignty, but other countries getting involved would ensure that the Palestinians and the Israelis both get just and fair solutions. The United Nations has passed many resolutions in the past, but the problem, like I mentioned earlier, is the inability, inability to enforce them. And like I said, as the United States, we're in a unique position to kind of pressure Israel into reverting back to those 1967 borders. And I like the suggestion by the UN representative of doing it in phases. That would be a lot easier. And I, I would probably think that the Israelis and the Palestinians would both be open to that. But again, the most important part is getting the negotiating process started. Now, some of my recommendations and justifications. Our main priority is ensuring the national security interests of the United States. And like I said, they're very closely tied to Israel. We have a very long history of arm, trading arms, um, sharing intelligence, and cooperating on uh, technological endeavors. So it's very important to us to maintain Israeli sovereignty, because if there is any threat to Israeli peace and our relationship with Israel in the region, we would no longer have quite as much access to these things, because Israel would no longer be in the position to provide them. Um, it's recommended, as I said, I will reiterate, reiterate, we need to expand the negotiating process to no longer just include the Palestinians and Israelis and ourselves. This is not an issue that just concerns us. I think peace in the Middle East, in general, in the entire region, concerns so many other countries, and we should get them involved. And we are in the position to do so. So I hope, Madam President, <laughs> that you take these into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much. Yes. I will invite the Chief of State to to the Presidency and Secretary of Defense, General Secretary, and all the members that are here for the benefit of the United States and the benefit of the both, both states concerning the Israel-Palestinian conflict. We have come up with a possible solution which could be and is a two-state solution. This part, the the two-state solution has not been effective, the United States of America will be patient to face whatever it means to follow the two-state solution because this is the best and this is the only one. Secondly, we will not risk our relationship with our allies as well concerning the 
relationship, which is Israel. Our allies have been a great benefit to us. They have helped us economically. They have helped us militarily, cooperation, intelligence gathering, and international support. To elaborate on this, on economic support, our state has exported $15 billion to Israel, which is a huge gain to our economy. We have facilitated our trade through United States-Israel Free Trade Agreement, which has given us a leverage to stop Israel's exporting our high technology to China, our rivals. Concerning the high technology to our rivals has to do with our security. The United States of America will only participate on the Israel-Palestine case in order for us to enhance our regional dominance, not to risk it. For that cause, we will make sure that we do our best to enhance a two-state solution. And at this moment, we have also benefited from Israel concerning military support. The United States has benefited on a large scale. Israel helped us to capture the Soviet technology during the Cold War, which gave us an edge to become the victors. The invasion of arrow anti-missile system, which has boosted our technology above the Russian or threat, was through joint military relation with Israel and our SW Asian military base in Israel, which serve as a counter threat to any Asia threat. We cannot abandon it. And for that cause, the United States of, United States of America will make sure that it keep its relationship with Israel and face a two-state solution that will benefit the both state. Now, what is the two-state solution? What I'm talking about this solution is, is this. Before we begin, this, the solution is short for a final settlement that would see the creation of an independent state of Palestine within pre-1960 ceasefire lines in the West Bank, Gaza, so Gaza strikes, East Jerusalem, and, and, and South Jerusalem as well. For the benefit of our state, we would also like to have give Turkey a side to participate in this case. But because of the uncertainty of Turkey, the United States of, the United States of America cannot risk its own abilities. So for that cause, we would like to face it ourselves because we have recognized Israel and Palestine as a state and we will not allow them to fight against each other because we will keep the state together and make sure that we consolidate democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief of State. Lastly, I would like to invite the Vice President to Thank give her remarks. So, there have been many solutions for that by this and ending conflict is didn't start yet. So, the two sides have their own narratives and which are virtually impossible to reconcile. So this conflict needs to end and solve urgently because many people are already suffering from this. So also the Israeli-Palestine conflict, it represents threats for the American national security. And today many Americans are dying because of this conflict. So the any solution what we should found is achieve peace and protect of the American interest in the world and especially in the Middle East. So here um, I made a summary of all the main representatives each of the states. And <clears throat> so uh, as, as national security advisors say that diplomatic means of solving in this conflict is not working. So we have to work directly with our old Middle East uh, partners like Jordan to help solve this conflict and to represent the Department of the Energy, she mentioned about the, we push, we need to push the peace in the Middle East, so, and normalize our relations with the Middle East so we can benefit from the gas. And the UN representatives say that prospering a new UN resolution is the solution, and a new res resolution that world considered the new development of Hamas and the Palestinian willingness to support the two-state solution. So as long as there is no peace, uh, the Russia may intervene, the, intervene to the Middle East and expand its influence. 
so in this area. So it's which is not good for America. So I highly suggest that this two-state solution as other general advisors, secretaries suggested. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for coming, my fellow officers, I and the chief of staff and the vice president with the Congress will deliberate on this and come up with the best policy option on the crisis of uh, the Israeli and Palestinian crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you.